Hit record again. I'll do my dates. Hey, before we get into it, loosebeers.com, the 2024 tour is kicking off uh, very shortly. We have Melbourne shows from April 9 until April 21, every night except for Monday, Melbourne Comedy Festival. Then in May, we've got Albury, Sydney, Central Coast, Newcastle, and Gold Coast. Then in June, I'm going to Hobart, Launceston, Adelaide. Then July, we've got Ballarat, Warrnambool, and Shepparton. Loosebeers.com for all of the specific dates and times. They're all selling really well, especially Melbourne, especially those Friday and Saturday shows. So get your tickets. I would love to see you there. Let's get into the show. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to episode three, two, six of the Spearhead Sundays podcast. I'm your host, Lewis Spears. Welcome to the show. We're joined by Keelan. Yep. Thank, nice hey. clap for himself. Hello. Hey. Um, hey. I almost got robbed when I was in Perth. I full on almost got robbed. Okay. Um, Here's how it goes. It was after one of my shows and uh, I am just amped up because it was a sick show and I didn't want to go to sleep. So I love having like a solo wander around the city. I love doing that shit. I've got a hotel. It's boring. I don't want to be there. I'm going to walk around by myself. So I <laughs> I go out and I go to, uh, I think it was uh, McDonald's and there's this dude sitting by himself. It's like... I think it was like a Friday or a Saturday night. He's sitting by himself. I walk in. Immediately, he asks me for money. He's kind of off his head a little bit. He goes, can I have some money? Ignore him. All right, don't have time for the pause. I want chips. I go up, and then he asks me to order something for him. And he's not homeless, by the way. Let me get that out of the way. Not a homeless guy. Wearing like a nice jacket. Like, no, I'm not buying you chips, dude. Ignore him. Order my shit. I start waiting. He starts yapping at me again, and then someone else comes in the store. He starts yapping at them. I'm like, okay, whatever. I just keep an eye on him, being street smart, waiting for my stuff. And then I get my food, and then he asks for some, for some chips, and I kind of move away from him, and then he just starts sprinting. And I turn around, ready to fight the guy, but he just ran on the bus. A bus pulled up. He sprinted on the bus. I'm like, okay, whatever. I take my McDonald's, and I go back to the hotel, and I, and I sit in my bed and I eat it. And if you've ever stayed in a hotel, the best thing about a hotel is eating food in the bed and, and even throwing a little bit of it around. I do that all the time, all right? Uh, and yes, it's incredibly disrespectful, but I don't think that you understand the freedom and the pure thrill and enjoyment that comes with pulling a pickle out of a burger and instead of putting it in the bin, just going... Uh, and just chucking it, not aiming it, not even trying to hit a funny spot, just like throwing it. Oh, a bit of lettuce fell in my bed out of the burger, chuck it in a different direction, see where it lands. That's a really good one. I was doing those ones. I was in Perth for 14 days, longer even. I can't even remember. It was a long time. So same hotel. So I also did did one thing because I, I hate getting I hate getting my room reset generally. If I'm there for like four days, I don't, I just say do not disturb, but I was there for a couple of weeks, so I needed the bed sheets changed. So what I started doing was I would get a, a takeaway coffee like every day uh, and I would drink it in the hotel room when I was doing some writing. Uh, so what I started doing was I started stacking them up on the windowsill every single day and then I had like a collection of them. This is what I like doing in hotel rooms, not trashing them, but like get, like giving the cleaner an incredibly confusing, surreal moment. That's my favorite thing. So I would stack them up on the windowsill uh, and I would put them all the way in the corner of the room on the windowsill and then cover it with a curtain so that the cleaner wouldn't see it. And then I got through almost like three weeks of, of daily. So like, you know, there were 20 plus... <laughs> Massive takeaway cups, empty, that on my final day, I lined them up on the, on the windowsill like a castle for the cleaner to find. That's a good one. A harmless prank that makes this person go, what the fuck? I swear I cleaned this room three times. <laughs> <laughs> Where did these come from? Did he have 20 in one day and then have a heart attack? That's a really good prank that, that won't cost you your deposit. Give him a story to tell. Uh, which is so much so I, I encourage that a lot more than than what a lot of people do. 
after they finish like a run in uh, at a comedy festival, like making like a harmless little funny pile of empty coffee cups is so much funnier than like hanging yourself and letting the cleaner find that. I wouldn't recommend that. That's the, you know, you want to give them a story, but you don't want to give them trauma. So, you know, <laughs> um, anyway, uh, what am I saying? Yeah, so I eat my McDonald's <laughs> and I'm throwing lettuce everywhere, having a great time. And then I go, you know what? I deserve an ice cream. So now it's like 1 a.m. I've been home for about an hour. Now it's 1 a.m. I'm going to walk down to 7-Eleven and I'm going to get myself an ice cream. Now I'm still fully dressed up in my show outfit. For my birthday, my mum, my 30th birthday, big special birthday, she got me this beautiful swarovski crystal necklace um now it it it's not but it looks like diamond like it's just glass like really beautiful glass it is it is like vague it's a couple hundred bucks but it's like a very special birthday gift very sentimental to me and i love wearing like sparkly shit especially on stage so i was wearing that and i went out on a friday night by myself wearing what looks exactly like a diamond necklace but it's just Swarovski crystal. And a funny thing I found out about Swarovski, um, because I just Googled it after I got it, because me and mum, we always used to go in there and look at the stuff because she she loves it. And then one day I went in and I was like, oh man, that that necklace is so cool. I would wear that on stage. That's cool. And then we checked the price and I was like, there's no way I would ever buy that. And then my 30th birthday, she got it for me. Really special gift. Very lovely. Um, one of like the, the, only, the only like really nice things of jewelry that I own. Um, but I, after getting it, I Google Swarovski. I'm like, I want to find out about it. Cause you see it everywhere. Uh, and apparently I just Google and search it on TikTok. They make like the, like in Australia, they're known as jewelry and trinkets in America. A lot of people know them as they make the best rifle scopes in the world. Cause it's glass, right? Really fine, beautiful, clear glass. Like, it's the Gucci of rifle scopes. If you have a Swarovski scope on your hunting rifle, people are like, bro, can I please look through that? That's the fucking shit. I wonder if they make camera lenses or anything else. But then I did some more research, and Swarovski, really, really, really old company. Uh, and look, we'll put it this way. When you look at their Wikipedia article, there's, there's you know how they have the sections? They've got products, exhibitions, news, controversy, early career, that type of thing. The first two categories of Swarovski is history, Nazi period. (laughs) And when they say Nazi period, bro, there wasn't a period. They were there from day one. Day one. Members of the Swarovski family were early, active, and enthusiastic champions of Nazism. I know, I know that Hugo Boss made the uniforms, but I don't also know that he was out there going, yeah, let's go, boys. Yeah. The Swarovski family were day one. Early, active, and enthusiastic champions. That's not what you want. When, when you have a really old business, you're probably going to have a check in history, but I don't think many old businesses with check in histories have the words early, active, and enthusiastic champions. Uh, imagine being a, a champion Nazi. <laughs> like, dude, they were, members of the Swarovski family, were members of the Nazi party when it was so small and when it was illegal to be a Nazi supporter. And I'm not talking like, Illegal now. I'm talking illegal then. Early active and enthusiastic champions of Nazism and at least six of its members maintained membership in the illegal party prior to Austria's annexation to Nazi Germany. In 1938, three weeks earlier, 500 marches in the Tyrolean town of Wattens or Wattens held a torchlight procession that ended with chants of Sieg Heil and Heil Hitler. The majority of participants, police determined, were Swarovski plant employees. <laughs> and among them were Swarovski family heirs Alfred Wilhelm and Friedrich. So they were like, they weren't just around in the early days. They were like 
All right, guys. Uh, after after work today, we're gonna you get an extra lunch break if you all attend the Nazi Party march. In its report to the state police on the 14th of February, 1947, the Innsbruck District Administrator called company head Alfred Swarovski an enthusiastic member of the NSDAP. Alfred Swarovski praised Hitler at business gatherings and took actions as a regional business leader to ensure that Tyrolean industry could be integrated as smoothly as possible into the enormous gears of the economy of Greater Germany and sent into the National Socialist Economic Order. He sent grateful loyalty greetings to Adolf Hitler on his 49th birthday and arranged a donation of 100,000 shillings for Hitler to establish a holiday home in Tyrol. Fucking crazy. I had no idea. And when you Google this, you don't find it. They've spent millions and millions of dollars on hiding this. One of the only places I could find it was like one guy made a TikTok about it and then it's on their Wikipedia page and that's kind of it. The contemporary Swarovski company commissioned historian Dieter Stiefel as a step towards dealing with our history in a serious and very proactive manner. So they employed a historian to lie. Is that, that's what that sounds like. Board spokesman Marcus Lang Swarovski said in 2018, however, the study was not published. <laughs> so they got a historian. Hey, man, can you get to the bottom of this and, you know, Proved to everyone that we weren't actually Nazis. And then the historian probably came back with his tail between his legs, seriously going, uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, you guys loved it. You guys loved it and were very active and enthusiastic and proactive champions of the Nazi agenda. This episode is getting demonetized for sure. Um, board spokesman Marcus Lang Swarovski said in 2018, however, the study was not published because Lang Swarovski said... Swarovski is a company that generally tries to keep the owner's personal stories largely out of the public eye because it does nothing for the business. <laughs> hey, why aren't you publishing the historical report about your, uh, your early founder's company's beliefs? Uh, probably because it makes us look like big Nazis. Because we were. So anyway, I was walking around Perth wearing my Nazi necklace. And, and of course, uh, someone wanted it. Dude, I can't, I can't, um, here's the thing. I can't really call out the behavior of the Swarovski business too much because the necklace is fucking sick. All right. And I'm pretty sure that it wasn't made by Nazis. Hopefully it was just like everything else I wear made by children. Um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, I'm walking around with wearing what, what looks like a diamond necklace. And I didn't really know. I didn't know that. Because in my head, I knew exactly what it was, which is just like fancy glass and like, you know, it's not cheap, but it's like a couple of hundred bucks. It's like a silver necklace, basically, same price. Um, but to everyone else, it looks like diamonds. Like I was out one night and these girls came up to me and were like, is that real diamonds? Oh no, they come up to me and they go, is that real? And I, I was like, yeah, it's real. Like thinking, yeah, real Swarovski. And they go, wow, I can't believe you're wearing that. Perth is pretty rough. I'm like, what do you mean? And she goes, oh, well, like, I wouldn't be wearing diamonds. I was like, oh, it's not diamonds. So I did already get warned about this days beforehand by a girl in Perth who was like, hey, don't wear that shit out. Anyway, I'm wearing it out 1 a.m. on like a Friday or a Saturday night, wandering around just looking for an ice cream. I go to 7-Eleven to get my ice cream. And then I'm walking back and it's, it's, a, it's like a really long road that I'm walking down. Lo and behold, I bump into the same guy that was asking me for chips and was kind of like, fuck you when I didn't give him chips. It's just me and him. I'm going in one direction. He's walking down the other. I have to walk. He's on a, an electric scooter and he's a big guy. Maybe six, three, right? But I'm an even bigger guy. And uh, we walk past, you know, like, you know how some people are just in the city, especially Friday, Saturday night, it's just, it's a lone dude. He's there by himself and he's just there to get into fights and scare people. Like just some incredibly insecure, broke loser from a rough background that fucking hates himself and only feels good by scaring small Chinese people. You know, like those 
type of people that that will like prey on like an Indian university student or a woman, uh, or like you know perceived weak people. I walk past him and he's on the scooter and he clocks me and recognizes me as the guy that wouldn't share his fucking chips, dog. And then he looks at me and he goes, "Oh, you're wearing real diamonds." And I kind of ignored him, kept walking. And then he turns around on the scooter and then I'm like, okay, we're fucking on. <laughs> and he goes, and I just kind of look at him and now I start walking backwards and I'm just walking backwards, like looking at him while he's following me very slowly. I still haven't said anything, right? Pretty scary. He's wearing a fucking, a fucking bandana on his head, not tied. You know, those fucking losers that think that they're in like, a rap clip from 2003, you know, like they really would like to have a cup of lean to fit in with the rest of the image, but he's wearing that over his head and he starts kind of following me. I'm walking backwards. And he's like, oh, you're wearing real diamonds. Uh, and he goes, you know, I'm on a scooter right now, but if I wasn't, I would swap you. And I said, I don't think you would. Because when it's like that point where someone's following you, you just have to kind of show that you're not scared. I was quite scared because here's the thing. I was much bigger than him, but he was clearly on a lot of drugs and they give you superpowers, right? So he starts following me and you can just tell that he's doing the math in his head of like, you ever see a you ever see a nature documentary where a lion is like looking at an animal that's much bigger than it? It's like, ooh, but I'm hungry. I might get kicked in the head here, but I'm pretty hungry. Is it worth the risk? And basically it's like, if that water buffalo has a sore leg, it's getting killed. If it shows vulnerability or weakness. So I'm just like walking backwards, looking at this dude, slowly stalking me, going, I don't think you would. And then he's like, you're lucky I'm on a scooter right now. And then he went off. And then I didn't wear my, my Nazi necklace out at night again. So that's, you know, something to be mindful of is uh, don't wear nice things out. I feel like that's new in Australia where I feel like you could do that, no worries, but that's new. I don't know what it is. I feel like public has gotten a little bit less safe in, I don't know, maybe the last two years, I feel. Because I go out at night, like I've been going at night, like fucking sometimes five times a week for the last like 10 years since doing stand up. And I definitely feel in the last, especially the last 12 months, it just feels like a, a level of danger is kind of, it's not dangerous. It's just like present where before it wasn't. Am I crazy? No, I agree. Like I saw, um, uh, like, yeah, like last week I talked about having to tell that guy off. I think I've maybe only been in that position once or twice in my whole life. Now I feel like I'm seeing it more. I don't know if I'm more vigilant or whatever, but I feel like I'm seeing it more. Like on that same night when I was going into the city, I saw signs everywhere that I've never seen before in Australia, uh, like anti-knife crime signs. And I'm like, fuck, I hate seeing that because that's real bad in London, in UK. Like my mate Alex, uh, he was telling me he's been like, robbed or almost robbed like three times and has seen knife fights. I've never seen a knife fight in my life. Uh, I have seen fights and stuff like that, but I also, I go to Australian rap concerts. So that's like, you know, you expect to see those. It's almost part of why you go. Um, but like just in general, in public, I've never seen like an anti-knife crime thing. Like in Melbourne, not in Frankston, you see that all, all those signs everywhere in Frankston, that's whatever. But like I was in... Where was I? I was at like, I think I was at Morty Alec, which is a nice area everywhere. Anti-knife crime signs. I'm like, fuck, I hate seeing those because that means that it's happening a lot. Um, I would just hate for it to get like, I saw a fucking video on Twitter, on Instagram. My brother sent it to me. I was like, hey man, don't send me this shit. You know, your mate that sends you just like, hey, check out this person dying. No context. I sent you that video of the man and the bear the other week. Yeah, you did that to me. Yeah. 
Yeah. But it was like a video of a bear. And I was like, oh, I like bears. They're cute. And it was like a guy kicking a bear in the woods for some reason. And then the bear turns around and is like, whoa. <laughs> like the bear has never in its life ever been confronted because it's a bear. It turns around and is like, whoa. And then there's like a little bit of like social anxiety from the human and the bear where they're both like, <laughs> and then the bear's like, oh yeah, I'm a bear. <laughs> and then the video ends. <laughs> That guy's dead. But it was really fun. I thought you'd laugh. Nah, I don't like stuff where people definitely die at the end. Instead, I got the message back from you. Don't send me stuff like that. <laughs> I started doing that because I have, I have had like four friends <laughs> that I still talk to all the time that, and that every now and then they'll send me really funny memes. There's like a line that I'll draw in terms of like videos where I like getting, I like getting sent stuff of like fat person falling over. <laughs> love that fat person falling over and snapping their ankle nah i like the nice harmless falling over keelan's face just like what you don't like a fatty breaking bones okay what about i always send you this page yeah it's two friends one guy filming one guy sits next to a fire like a big campfire and mm. every single video is seeing what they can put in the fire to cause a biz biggest explosion to hurt his friend <laughs> do you like those videos yes because to because that's like jackass. Yeah. That's fine. I, yeah, there's a there's a level of pain that I enjoy genuinely enjoy seeing on social media and it's it's never it's it's like mauled to death by bear? No. <laughs> Fatty falling down the stairs? Absolutely. <laughs> Fatty falling down the stairs and then getting mauled by a bear? No. Fatty falling down the stairs and their leg snaps? Yuck. Don't like that. But two idiots filming each other knowing that they're doing something stupid and then it does happen. You know what it is? It's like I can enjoy it as long as there's a really big noise in there. You know, like a massive bang. <laughs> like someone's head hitting something tin and it echoes. Love that. But yeah, I feel like everyone, has, every male has that friend that just like, especially in the group chat, just like pops in a fucking video of someone's head exploding or, or like an animal dying in a fucked way. And you just, have, you just, you have to be like, don't ever do that again. Because they all have their mates that love that, you know? Like, I feel like Joe Rogan is that mate where if you see uh, an animal getting mauled and it takes like fucking 35 minutes for it to die you would send that to joe and he'd be like cool yeah you know but he sent that to me and i'd be like ah i don't want to no. i don't want to watch this at all um what was i fucking talking about what was i saying I have no idea how I've gotten to this point oh, of like... Your brother like, sent you a knife crime, your brother sent Oh, you my go. brother. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. I, man, this podcast is in shambles and always has been and always will be. Uh, join the Patreon. Um, yeah, my brother sent me this video. Yeah, knife crime. That's right. It's real bad in UK. My brother sends me this CCTV video of like, there's a guy with a girl in a chicken shop and these two other dudes see him and they must have beef or whatever. And they come in and they fucking from their pants pull out, not a knife, a fucking machete. That's so big, it's barely even a machete. It's actually just, just a sword, right? And then that guy turns around and sees two dudes with fucking swords. And then out of his pants pulls another fucking sword and they start like jousting. Like they know what they're doing to the point where like if you... If you've never used a machete, you're trying to kill someone, you probably go from up, down. These guys are actually fencing, like like moving forward, moving backwards. Like they've done it before. They know what they're supposed to do. They start fencing in this fucking chicken shop. No one actually gets hit because everyone's terrified of getting hit. So they're all moving back. And the guy ends up scaring the other two guys out and they all run away and no one gets hurt. But like, fuck, how scary. That shit's happening. And my mate in England, I'm like, how come? Because you see that and you see all of the like right wing people doing the fear mongering stuff. And I'm like, how real is this? Right. And he's like, oh, I've seen it a few times and it's very scary and it's real. Like this knife bins fucking everywhere. And it's like, fuck, I would hate for that to be a part of Australia because it's not. It's, it's, 
there's definitely subcultures of it, like uh, in rougher areas, it's a big problem. But it's not like in the CBD where, like, you know, <laughs> heaps of people around you have knives. We don't have that yet. But yeah, I hated seeing the anti knife crime ad because it's like, fuck, that means it's ticking up. I don't like that it's ticking up. Because you know what that is? I just lose my, my like, invulnerability of being big. You know, and so do you. It's a superpower, just being big. It's like nothing really happens to you and everyone around you is safe just because of your presence. But then the moment people have guns and knives, it's just like even playing field for everyone. Scary shit. You know what I think about the the weapons? Uh, I'm stoked that we don't have guns. I love that you're not allowed to carry a knife. I think that women only should be allowed to have pepper spray. I think that is... Because I think you can have it in Perth. Um, I reckon that should be a law where where women have to do like maybe a... I don't know, not even a safety check because you're probably not going to fucking go out of your way to pepper spray someone because you're going to get it. I reckon women are allowed to have a permit to buy pepper spray and no one else can. And then I reckon then we're sweet. Because then it, it, it evens the playing field. Because women can't defend themselves against men. It's not possible. Unless they're like highly trained martial arts people. It's it's just the size difference alone. It's like, it's like you know, me versus a teenager. You know, it's like they could maybe hit me and hurt me. But it's, you know. But if they had pepper spray, that's going to make every dude think twice. If, if, if we all know that every woman has pepper spray. And you can make them cute, you know. As well, because that would discourage men from carrying it, getting women to buy it for you. If if you, if every pepper spray can was pink and had like a a little bauble on it and a keychain and it, and it was like really fucking gay, that would ensure. <laughs> that, like, if you yassified pepper spray, that would keep it out of the hands of every dude and just in the hands of women only. I think that's how it should be done. Um. Anyway, knife crime bad, and uh, I almost got robbed, but thank God I didn't because I'd be devastated to lose my birthday Nazi crystals. I shouldn't call them that, and because here's the thing, I feel like it's uh, the problem with with fully understanding a company's problematic history is that it before I knew all of this, I could wear the crystals guilt free, no worries. What a beautiful necklace and an incredibly heartfelt gesture from my mum, whom I love for my 30th birthday. Every time I wear them, I think of the bond we share. Now, every time I put them on, I think of the early enthusiastic <laughs> and active champion of the Nazi party. And then I feel like a hypocrite from wearing it. But I'm just going to forget that amnesia. Happened, happened a long time ago, whatever. You got Hugo Boss is still at Chadston. Um, anyway, uh, have you seen this breakdancing dad? Yeah. It's, this is the, every now and then you see something that's like objectively really bad. Uh, but then you also realize that how fucking funny it is. Uh, it's really good stuff. Let me pull it up here. Okay. Love this. Okay. Logged on to Twitter. This is the first thing I see. Okay. I wake up at 6 a.m. to do some work. I get my coffee. I sit down. I open my computer. And what am I greeted with? Well, hundreds of comments calling me a deadbeat dad, a child abandoner, and all manner of other insults. So I think... Let's get this out of the way straight away. Just from the way that he's talking... Horrible father, okay? If you have uh, been accused of being a deadbeat father by your kid and you respond with, like, a commentary video, yeah. you dress up, you turn the lights on, and you and you start talking like you're presenting a video, she's right. You know, you're a bad dad, okay? Even if what she's saying about you is not technically true or factual, 
the way that you respond, you should respond to preserve your relationship with your daughter is like a phone call or like a, or like a lunch where you both cry and then, and then make up and then it happens in private. But <laughs> dude, a reaction video to your daughter calling you a deadbeat dad, dunking on her, getting millions of views. She's right. <laughs> You're a bad dad. Even if what she says isn't technically correct, bad dad. So let's get that out of the way. And enjoy the rest. What's this all about? Well, after a few minutes of investigation, I discover that my daughter, Maddie, has made a video about me. She's a screenwriter in Hollywood. She's also a big social media influencer with millions of followers. Some of her videos get millions of views. And this video has tens of millions of views. One million likes, 20,000 comments, 40,000 bookmarks, 30,000 reposts. It's just insane. So I thought classic narcissist dad going, look how famous I am. I'm getting so much attention because I, because I've emotionally neglected my daughter at the very least. Also really love the Bitcoin shirt too. Like you see the Bitcoin shirt and you're like, this guy is just here to market Bitcoin and, uh, and become famous. And, but wait, it gets so good at the end. I'd better watch this video. And frankly, I was pretty chagrined by what I heard, to say the least. But honestly, the more I watch this video, the more I like it. Well, I like about 98% of it. However, I do need to correct a few statements in the video. But first, let's just watch Maddie's 90-second video. And then I'll give you my comments. What's a piece of trauma that you have? That's funny. It has to actually be funny. I'll go first. My dad abandoned my family when I was five years old. That is um, a wife and four kids. He abandoned us and then pursued amateur breakdancing. <laughs> Some more context is needed here. Needless to say, I will, uh, I will talk about this in a moment. All right, let's continue with the video. That's so funny is a father abandoning his his wife and kids to pursue break dancing because it's not because i don't think there would be a funnier dance to start doing publicly and virally after abandoning your family maybe tap dancing but even then tap dancing i feel like has a little bit more like you can be 50 or 60 and tap dance and people will be like oh that's cool he's continuing a tradition it's like if he's break dancing you know that if he's really good now, he started doing it minimum 40. <laughs> so it's just like a real midlife crisis moment. And he got really good. <laughs> he like blew up. Like he became like a D-list celebrity status, like viral breakdancer. He became like the oldest actively competing breakdancer in the world. Then he got a Good Morning America. Look how, look at his expression on his face, how, how proud he is to hear his daughter, who he has like an estranged relationship with, say that he's good at breakdancing. He's like, we don't, we don't say happy birthday to each other, but she knows that I'm a good breakdancer. That's awesome. And in, you know what? You would have to be, like, he, he would have to be really fucking good. Because to have a horrible relationship with your kids, for them to also acknowledge that, yeah, he was an asshole to me, but fuck, he's good at fishing. You know, you would have to be twice as good as what she's actually saying. And talk shows and Washington Post wrote about him and he went super viral and he did all these interviews and he danced with Paul Abdul and here I'll show you. To see, take a look at this 60 year old break dancer. Yes, 60 years Okay, he's really good. Amazing. This guy's really he's fucking good. He's competing at a break dancing competition in Philadelphia and he may not have won but he, I tell you what, he is winning over a lot of people on the internet. Yes. He really is. Hang on, yeah. hang on. I've just noticed that in this breakdancing video, he's wearing a different Bitcoin shirt. <laughs> How many Bitcoin shirts does this father have? This is so awesome. I feel like there's uh, there's like maybe two or three kinds of Bitcoin millionaires. There's the guy that can't make eye contact or leave his house and will not spend the money because he genuinely has no use for it. So he just continues to invest it Maybe he'll buy houses and you'll find out that he's a billionaire, but it doesn't really count because he can't shower. So it's like, I can't be impressed because you may have made all of this money, but it, but it definitely came from getting in early on Bitcoin because you were, you were a heavy contributor of racist forums in 2011. <laughs> and he can't even enjoy the money because he just does, he lacks the social skills. Then there's like, 
the the sociopath Bitcoin millionaire, which is definitely this guy of like, yeah, look at me. I made it with Bitcoin because I'm smarter than you and you're an idiot. Oh, you weren't on 4chan in 2014? Guess you're fucking stupid. Anyone could have done this. If you're homeless, you should be shot. And that's this guy of like, oh, good. My daughter is exposing me for being an, an emotionally unavailable father who, you know, even if I did give her money, I never gave her time. Great. I can promote Bitcoin and breakdancing with this. This guy wouldn't pay my medical bills. That is not true. More on that in a minute. Okay, that's probably copyrighted. He like custody or anything. Like, he just, like, left four kids to do that. He may not have paid for some of my medical bills growing up, but he did give me this breakdancing merchandise. So that's him. He's on his back. That is a nice shirt. His B-boy name. Plugging his merch. Cards. Excellent. You know, I'll get texts like this. Happy birthday, question mark. And then, like, links to his to his breakdancing videos. That's true. Like, you have funny trauma. Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is, like... This is classic 40, 40 to 50 year old like divorced dad who thinks like, oh, like actually some people who are not divorced, mothers and fathers have this attitude like, oh, I don't have to like tell my daughter she's beautiful because I paid for her school uniform. You know, I've given her money and, and I paid the electricity bill and she has bed sheets. So I don't have to like give her a hug or tell her I love her because I've actually financially supported her and like the seven-year-old girl is like why doesn't dad like me <laughs> it's like, doesn't understand money so many parents are, are like that of like oh yeah but i like funded their existence i kept their physical needs met so why do they want to spend time with me what are they fucking gay ha ha trauma i need to hear it thank you okay in many ways i love this video and of course i love my daughter maddie and we get along great at least i think we do but if you <laughs> What do you mean? We get along great. She's fucking, she's telling you that you haven't seen each other for fucking ages as she didn't respond to your happy birthday text or your check out my breakdancing text. We get along great. It's like, no, you guys don't like fight because you don't have the opportunity to see each other enough because you've seemed to have at the very least emotionally abandoned her. But anyway, keep on dunking on your daughter, Bitcoin man. Actions are in order or at least a few things that need to be put in context. First, I can see that as a five-year-old, Maddie would see her dad as having abandoned the family. One day I was living there, the next day I wasn't. And that will look like abandonment to a child. But married couples do get divorced about half the time in America. And I was just living a mile or so down the street in LaGrange, Illinois. We just weren't living under the same roof. Now, about not paying medical bills, that's just not correct. And this guy just goes into a, a big spiel about how he did give a lot of money and maybe the, the mother has been lying about it or whatever. I don't know what's true. Maybe it's all true, but it's pretty clear that the guy has like a horrific relationship with his daughter because if you had a good one, she's not making that video. So it's like, I'm going to... I'm going to believe the kid here because if you have a good relationship with your dad, you're probably not going to make this shit, especially if he has like a public platform. And also a good father probably would call their kid to kind of go, hey, it looks like you have these awful feelings. Can we get to the bottom of this and maybe we could sort it out instead of like, great, here's an opportunity to dunk on my kid on TikTok. I get along great with all my kids, including Maddie. At least I think I do. So the kids are doing just fine despite dad's many shortcomings. One other slight correction, which I hesitate to even bring up, because I love the way Maddie did this in her video. I did not abandon the family for breakdancing. I have a career. I'm in the advertising business. Built an ad agency. That's how I was able to afford to pay Maddie's mom $5 million. And then he goes, I gave her $5 million. Anyway, uh, this is about a 10 minute video. We're skipping ahead. Let's just skip like right to the end, which is obviously right for the, for the first eight minutes I've been going, this guy's a fucking piece of shit. He's a bad father. I don't like this guy. He's obviously, even if he has financially supported the kids and maybe the mom is a bit of a bitch too and is lying about them, he's obviously hasn't been there enough for the kids to recognize that he loves them and they love him back, all right? But then... Some are hilarious. Here are... I didn't know my dad was bald until my... He's reading comments. ...week of Mother's Day while following us. 
This one from Chris Shell. Oh Shell. my god, shut up. My world's dumbest criminal. Okay. Maddie, you are very creative and talented. Keep doing exactly what you're doing. And now he just plays, wearing another Bitcoin shirt as well. Now he just plays two minutes of him breakdancing. And the video goes from what is, what is you know, could maybe be called um, emotionally abusive by the father to like, okay, fuck it. He can breakdance really. Oh, I can't believe he's 65. This is fucking sick. And now I like him again. This is the thing. Sometimes you are so good at something that you can be a fucking piece of shit and everyone in your life is like, yeah, dude, let's go. And uh, that's this dude where that video <laughs> got millions and millions and millions of views on Twitter, on TikTok, everywhere, because as awful as the guy seems to be, fuck, he can break dance and no one can take that away from him. And that's, that's how good I want to be at comedy is like no matter how much of a dick I can be to other people, people will always go, fuck, that's cool. I feel like people will only do that with like musicians or if you have a very funny skill like breakdancing. Like if I was a if I was a yo-yo champion at at 72, I feel like people would excuse me hitting my kids. They'd be like, yeah, but like, have you ever seen him walk the dog? <laughs> Like, I know he chained his toddler up, but have you seen him fucking walk the dog? <laughs> that is cool. Have you, can you believe this guy's 65? That's, that's got to be the funniest way to respond to your, your kids saying that you've, like, emotionally neglected them for their entire life is just breakdancing in front of a Bitcoin flag while wearing a Bitcoin T-shirt. That's definitely not good father behavior, but fuck, it makes it entertaining. I really do like that we're at this point in, in the internet and it's only going to get worse where like families now get to beef on social media and that's going to be delivered directly to the feeds of some of people in a different country. And now I'm talking about it on a podcast. Like before the best gossip you'd ever hear would be maybe from the street down the road. Now it's like delivered straight into my phone and now I get to summarize it for you guys. And that's the world we live in. And, and that's not good, but it's also entertaining. That's <laughs> so funny. And now that girl forever has to be like, th this video has gone so viral that she's like going to get recognized in the street. Because I love when I get recognized. People are like, man, I love the podcast. I love, I love your stand up. I've seen you live. If people are coming up and you're like, man, your abusive father or at the very least, your neglectful father is really good at breakdancing. Sucks that he wasn't like there for you when you were crying when you were seven though, hey. And she's just at the coffee shop. <laughs> it's probably not what you want to be known for. <laughs> you know that Andy Warhol quote of like, everyone will be famous? Like this is what he was, he was projecting. Like you're going to go through a messy divorce and, and kind of hate your dad, but acknowledge that he's sick at drag dancing and now the whole world is going to know. <laughs> and all it really has done is made him more famous for break dancing. Like this, this guy, for sure, if he organized it within the next month, could definitely go on like a, of, of like a, a, a moderately successful break dance tour. That would, that if he put tickets on sale right now, guarantee you he could fill a few hundred seaters and make a bit of money break dancing for 15 minutes Woo! he doesn't see his kids but check out that handstand that's really good i think we're gonna end it there guys that's the end of the episode uh i think what we can really take from this episode is um the swarovski family were were early active enthusiastic champions of the nazi cause and uh that's made me question wearing my my necklace because what what do you think is more powerful um the the holocaust or a mother's love that's what i'm wrestling with mother's love yeah but only because i'm not jewish you know <laughs> at what do you think is more powerful a father's neglect or his sick breakdancing skills? Sick breakdancing. Unfortunately, 
Correct. <laughs> All right, we're going to leave it there. I'll talk to you next Sunday. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you have a shit one. Bye.